Hi everyone. Hi. So I'm Chris. I'm Phil. Hey. So last week we had our Fighting First uh, launch event. As part of that, we, um, we wanted to get some questions from you guys. Um, it's very easy for us to sit around the studio and, and work on projects. And sometimes it's really nice to find out what things you're excited by, what things you're interested in, what questions you've got once you've had a chance to look at it. So we put a, poll, uh, put a uh, thread up on Facebook, we asked for your questions, and we've got a bunch of really good ones. So we wanted to sit down and have a chat about them. Now, normally I would have asked James, not Phil, to answer them for me. Um, James doesn't work at Battlefront anymore, so I thought, who best to answer my questions than Phil? And the reason for that is, in case you hadn't uh, noticed in the credits, James wrote Fighting First. Yep. Now, and before Fighting First, what, you wrote the previous two mid-war books? Um, I worked mainly on um, oh, Africa Corps, and I... James worked on mainly on the um, Desert Rats. Yep. So I was actually thinking in version one. Version one, two, version two and two? a half. Yeah, <laughs> going back a few years. Yep. So, yeah. So, we thought maybe we'll just crack into the questions, and uh, we'll see how we go. So first up, Dimitri was asking what the rationale behind the M3 Stuarts being two points a tank when British Honeys with a much better hit rating are three for five. I'm guessing that's three vehicles for five points? Yep. So Instead the... of three for six. Yeah. Yep. The main reason is that they're really quite different in the whole way they play. The British okay. um, have their approach of if it doesn't work, we'll go away and come back another day. So their last stand rating is right. really quite poor. Because it's like five plus. Five plus. So um, that's a, a downside to them. And the other thing on the upside is the American Stuarts have their stabilizers. Right. So a moving British Stuart gets one shot. Yep. A moving American Stuart gets two shots. Twice the bang. Twice the bang. And uh, Rocky asked, how do, you th uh, how do you feel the army lists in Fighting First might feel and play differently from the American late war lists? Thematically, do you think they have a different flavour? I think that's a really good question actually. Yep. And what we've tried to do, which I hope is reflected in the answer to this question when you actually try it out, <laughs> is reflect the fact that the Americans at this point mm -hmm. are green. Yep. They've done a lot of... Um, theory work and made up a lot of clever ideas based on yep. what they witnessed in France and in the desert, although mostly, mostly based on what they witnessed in France or heard second hand or third hand about <laughs> what happened in France. Yep. So they came up with all these great theories about how the war was going to be uh, fought and given that the British were clearly not doing it right because they hadn't won yet, they weren't too keen on listening to the British about right. um, things. So they went into battle absolutely knowing how it was going to happen and um, were slightly um, disillusioned when things didn't quite work out. Yeah. So that, that's translating into having a 5 plus skill. So yep. what in mid-war we'd be normally talking about trained or veteran, so yep. 3 or 4 plus skill ratings. Yep. Um, so what, less of the fancy tricks, so less, of, less using shoot and scoot, less using blitz moves, that sort of thing? Yep, but their uh, motivation is fairly high, so follow me and charge type tactics uh, where their mind's at at the moment. Yep. Um, and there is hit on numbers, uh, yep. essentially what, um, you know, one rank down. It's sort of like the British with their cru uh, cruisers, with their charge at all costs mentality. The Americans have the same general mm. idea. Yeah, I noticed, where is it, the uh, Stuart platoon, we were just talking about the Stuarts. Yep. So, sitting there with a reckless hit on 2+, plus, yeah. that's uh, what, unheard of for Americans in, in late war. Yes. So realistically, you're talking a, a sort of a hard charging, mix it up, get in there, get forward force yep. in mid-war, and then come late war. They get a considered. little more considered and experienced. Although, interestingly, um, hard charging, but not really so assault oriented. Right. They're still firepower, but point blank range firepower. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Get around the flanks and um, yeah. do the business. So who's next? Let's go with James' question. Any plans to do a plain old plastic M4? So I presume you mean an M4 as opposed to M4A1 or A2 or A3 or any of the other mm. variants. So Chris. Now, I'll, I'll say now. A Sherman is a Sherman to me. Okay, you're not a great sort of um, fan of the uh, rivet counting on the Sherman? Not the rivet counting. No, it's a pretty <laughs> terrible idea. So what, 
are we going to see a um, a different a standard M4 Sherman? No, not not in the near future. Um, we've got the M4A1. Uh, we've got the late M4A3 um, with the 75 mil version, with the 76 mil version, 105, 105 version, um, armored as well. Armored, yep. So that that really covers I guess, all the basics for right now. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so next up, Andrew asked. Uh, I think that one particularly interesting unit in Fighting First is the Recon Patrol. Uh, it contains two, uh, two Scout armoured cars and a Jeep with an MG and a mortar. And he wants to know, if I bring the armoured recon company from the cards, so that means the command cards, with two to six recon patrols, it's a lot of Jeeps, um, does each recon patrol count as a separate battery with its own pre-planned bombardment? Yes, if that's how you want to um, field your force, as a whole lot of light recon, yep. it certainly does. So you would end up, it's back a couple of pages. Oh, just with the M10s, isn't it? Yep. There we go. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite an interesting unit. There's some photos of it here. But you've got your um, armoured cars, two Jeeps, one with a machine gun, one with a mortar. And the mortar is an artillery piece. Right. So yes, you'd end up with lots and lots and lots of one gun bombardments. <laughs> so, so not particularly accurate then, but... And not particularly mm -hmm. long ranged, mm -hmm. but yep. <laughs> Actually, now that's, that's, that does lead me to, not a question, but a comment maybe. Um, a long time Flames of War player, um, whenever I've seen the, the Jeep with a 60mm mortar and actually the Universal Carrier with Piat, because everyone loved Universal Carriers with Piat's, the common misconception right is that it's a guy firing the mortar from inside the vehicle or in the case of the Piat, you know, in the, in the rules it used to replace the hull mounted Bren gun, right? Yeah. So the thought was, oh, well, he's obviously got it on the front of the Bren, gun, uh, Bren yeah. carrier firing it. That's not the case, is it? No. Um, because the time scale of Flames of War is flexible so mm. that whatever your orders uh, require is how long it takes. Yep. So clearing a minefield takes hours. So if your turn involves clearing minefields, then clearly your turn is hours long. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if your turn is all about a few close assaults, it might only be five or 10 minutes. Yep. But what matters is how long it takes to um, issue some orders and have them implemented and right. be ready to issue more orders. So the reason for talking about that is that um, your Jeep guys actually just carry the mortar in the Jeep. Yep. They've got the base plate, they've got the mortar, they've got the bipod and so forth. Right. And uh, when they want to fire, they pull to a halt with the Jeep, everybody jumps out carrying their bit of the mortar, yep. quickly assemble the mortar, grab some ammo, ammo off the Jeep, fire off a few rounds, yep. pack it all up and get back in the Jeep and move right. off. So we don't model that in the game because no. that would just be painful and annoying. So you just say, your Jeep is here and it's firing, but you need to imagine that the guys have jumped out beside it and yep. getting ready to fire. That makes sense. Okay, Ryan. Yeah. Ryan said, what list in Fighting First did you guys in the studio enjoy working on the most? So, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did a lot of, no, I, I, I'm lucky I get to sit and I get to watch all the hard work happen with the books. Um, well, I, I dispute to, that you don't okay. do a lot of hard work in the background as well. <laughs> yeah, I spend a lot of time, yeah, in the background doing stuff, but I'm, for someone that always thought the Lee, the Grant, were just ugly tangs. There's something about them in here. I really like them. Um, the look, the yellow decals, that's my favorite thing. That's my contribution to the, to the whole project that people will actually see is pushing for yellow decals. Um, I just think they look cool and that's why I'm building a Lee Force. Yeah, I can understand that. For me, I really don't know. Um, <laughs> Like most of the books, the stuff in them is all really, really cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I love the Shermans. Um, British Grants, yeah, American M3 medium Lees, not so much. <laughs> but the Stuarts with their Charge, Madly. Stuarts are cool. Um, Armoured Rifle Company, it's just such a different thing from what anybody else does. Mm. Rifle Company, it's the first really solid rifle company we've got in yeah. World War. Um, even the tank destroyers. I suppose for me that's the one that's least sort of my thing. Yeah. But yeah. Um, since we're talking about the colour of tanks and decals, Greg asked why did the Yanks, he means the Americans, uh, choose yellow for their tank markings initially? Well actually they started with white. Okay. Then they went to low-vis pale blue. Pale blue would have been nice. 
Yep. The Wouldn't problem was it. it was too low vis. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy may not have seen their markings, right. but they couldn't either. Yep. <laughs> so they went to yellow thinking, okay, it's an intermediate color. It's yep. not quite as um, out there as white, yep. um, but not too low vis. In fact, the Germans did the same thing. Uh, in Poland, yep. they went into battle with um, white crosses. Yep. They yep. didn't have the black bit in the middle quickly painted them yellow yeah, uh, to yep. try and reduce their visibility and then painted the centers out on most of them yep. uh, to reduce the visibility further. Um, it would seem that the yellow markings were still too low vis, especially right. when they got colored, uh, covered by dust and so forth. That makes sense. So they quickly went back again uh, for the rest of the war to white to try and actually, I mean, if you're gonna put the marking on there, yes. it's there for your friends to see, yes, <laughs> so they need that. to be able to see it. <laughs> I'm gonna say Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, is Fighting First the one and only book for mid-war Americans or are there plans for more US forces in the future? Well, it is the only um, dedicated American book right. we have a plan for at the moment. Yep. However, we also have a plan for a, um, a book covering the various elite forces. Mm. So paratroopers, rangers, commandos, that sort of thing. Yeah, Forschmjäger. So, Forschmjäger, yep. Oh, has to pronounce it correctly. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, actually, that's terribly, terribly mispronounced. <laughs> um, just vaguely close. Right. Right. <laughs> Better than Kiwi German, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so you'll see uh, paratroopers and rangers coming in the future. Yeah. But what you also see is when you see the command cards, and there's been a few previews of some mm. of this, um, one of the things in the command cards is the ability to reflect some of the units that fought right through the Tunisian campaign. So they started at the beginning of November yep. and fought all the way through to the beginning, beginning of May. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, six, seven months. And the units that did that sort of improved quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. So. You can take um, certain units as veteran units. So yeah. the command cards will say, for instance, that your um, armored rifle platoons become have these rating changes, yep. um, four plus X points per platoon. Okay. Or your armored rifles machine guns have blah, blah, blah. So yeah. Cool. So at the moment, it's not a project we're working on right now in terms of the, uh, the, the paratroopers book. It's in the schedule and it is coming, but we've got a bit more stuff to do before we get into that book. All right, so I'm going to throw this one to, to Phil. Um, Mark asked, what, are, what about the upcoming wildcard slots for the Americans? Will they have the ability to take free French? Well, that's an interesting idea. Um, I think it's cool. <laughs> it's not something that we've um, got on the schedule at the moment. No, it, um, but I don't think we'd even discuss the words free French and yeah. Americans in a sentence before the scene is question. No, I mean, they've got some weird and wonderful stuff. Uh, Stuart's, yeah. Valen sorry, sorry, Stuart's, Samoa's, Valentine's, yep. um, early war French guns and things. So all sorts of weird and wonderful mm. equipment. The biggest problem is just trying to find time to fit in the schedule, but yeah. it's a great idea and it's now on the list of <laughs> Things we will one day fit in the schedule. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think I definitely think it's cool. Someone with an early war French force. I love the idea of it. Um, it's all about trying to trying to add it in somewhere. Mm. All right. Next up's a technical question. I don't do technical questions. Larry asked. Uh, okay, the U.S. Marines landed on Guadalcanal three months ago. Three months ago, in terms of the time period in the in the book, um, they have canister ammo and gung ho for their 37mm guns. Do the Fighting First 37mm have canister shot? No, they don't. Why? Um, I literally don't know. As far as I can tell, the answer comes down to, uh, particularly in the wide open spaces of the desert, the Americans figured that um, canister shot, which is only useful for last ditch defense against yep. massed infantry, really wasn't the thing they were going to need. Yep. Um, whereas in Guadalcanal, their experience to that point in the war had been that the Japanese were quite willing to um, use close range charges yep. by enough infantry um, that basically your 37s weren't going to be firing a lot of AP, yep. armored piercing, um, and their HE shells might not even have time to fuse and detonate at right. some of the ranges you're going to see in the Pacific. Right. So they figured canister, which they had in stock, right. might be a useful thing. <laughs> so just like Vietnam, same, same theory. Yeah. Close range fighting. Uh, 
the lack of wide open spaces and, and the a, lack of a, tanks. Yeah. yeah, and the enemy so, that's keen to get in close. Yeah, so in Vietnam, tanks would carry significant parts of ammunition stock as canister, whereas in Europe, it was like, why? If they get that <laughs> close, we are stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fair. Well, um, well, we'll cover a bit of old ground again. Uh, Adam asked, will there be any future add-ons or expansions to fighting first? And I think we've pretty much covered that. Um, and he asked what the wild card slot will be for. The interesting part is, what about previous mid-war monsters? That's a definite candidate mm. for wild card. That's the sort of thing we had in mind for the yeah. wild card slot. Things that are just way outside the norm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a possibility for that. Once more, like the Fighting French, it's a matter of finding mm. a slot for these things. But yeah, bringing back all the mid-war monsters is yep. something I'd be really keen on. Yep. Was sort of a... It was definitely a pet project for you back then, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. 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 All right, while we're doing, we'll jump back to another technical question. William asked, why are M10's front armour five in mid-war and only four in late war? Well, as part of the whole uh, mid-war project, yep. we went back and um, revamped the underlying calculations that we right. used to work things out. Way, way, way back 17 years ago, yep. when I first started, the um, spreadsheets were pretty basic. Right. Um, it it means you went... Not quite that basic. <laughs> um, and over the years, they evolved and evolved and evolved to the point where they grew into big monsters. Yep. So for Team Yankee and V4, um, we revamped the whole thing and started again. Yep. And particularly for Team Yankee, we had to. We didn't have any existing stuff. Yep. So we built, a, uh, well, not a new model, we rebuilt the model to um, work really well for Team Yankee. Yep. And then we brought it back into mid-war. Yep. And the result is that some things are a little bit different from what you might have um, seen before, mm. but it's more a result of um, a little more data being available now yep. and a little more sophisticated modeling. Yeah, I mean, I guess when Phil started working on it, the internet didn't exist. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Dave asked, uh, why was the Armored Reconnaissance Company relegated to a command card and not in the normal force organizations? I think relegated, I think, is an unfair term, personally. I think one of the things that, just because it's not in the book, I don't think it's being relegated. Is that, would that be a yeah. fair statement? Yeah. It's about the design of the book. We want the books to be easily accessible hmm. by um, new players as well as valuable to old players. Yeah. Now, when you see the old Flames of War version 3 books that are yay thick, yeah, as a beginner, you pick it up and go, what am I going to do here? That's going to get turned into a meme. <laughs> and, and so we wanted it to be basically really straightforward for yep. a beginner. What do you want? This tank, this tank, this tank, yep. armored infantry, foot infantry, or tank destroyers, this tank. Yep. So it's really straightforward. These are the core of any force. Mm. Now, even if you're making an armored reconnaissance company, I'm betting that you're still going to use one of those basic forces as the core of it, you, because an armored reconnaissance company just can't chew up that many points. Yeah, I was going to say, it happened to have the page still open at three points for the platoon, six that's platoons is 18 points, the plus HQ, an HQ maybe 20 points. points. Yeah. I mean, that's what, three, less than three Shermans? Yeah, that, it's, it really is a support formation at that point, right? Yeah. So we wanted to keep it focused and simple for the beginners. Yep. Now, if you are wanting more variety, the uh, command cards are really easy to get add-on. We made sure they're yeah. nice and cheap and readily available. Yep. And that gives you the ability to field all the other oddball stuff you want. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. So Norman wanted to know mm. whether we'll be seeing um, a version of the 88 with limber wheels, etc. Mm. Now I presume he means in plastic since we already do it in mm. um, a metal kit. Yep, so at the moment we've got the 88 gun itself in plastic. There's no plan to make a plastic um, limber set, but since you're, you're interested, we thought we'd look at putting it into the special order catalog. So basically an upgrade pack if you want, where you can get the, the, the limber set to then pimp out your, your plastic 88 if you want to. Yep. Um, Mark asked, uh, very excited to see the early uh, model Shermans in plastic. 
Uh, when are we going to see them slip into the British Army? Slip into the British yeah. Army. I like that one. <laughs> the, um, sometime early next year, we'll yep. be releasing another British book. Now, um, the reason we're doing two for the British, and we said we went for the Americans, is that for the early release, we wanted to keep it um, fairly simple. And the British used everything. They used almost everything the Americans used, yeah. plus a whole bunch of their own stuff. <laughs> Putting that all out right at the beginning would have been just um, too much. It would have, um, it would have been you know, too difficult for us as an organization as well, looking at the yeah. amount of plastics and so on. Yeah. Yep. So we decided to break it into two phases. The first phase, which we brought out, yep. then we bring out the Americans, which releases a whole bunch more models for them. We can have the Sherman, yep. the Priest, and so forth. Yep. And then we'll bring out the second British book, which will bring out some more British tanks yep. um, and add rifle companies and all sorts of other stuff. Everything that you've basically been asking for. Yep. Um, and bring all of the other stuff into one big pile. So we had to split the British in two because they were just too big. Mm -hmm. But yes, it'll be out soon, sometime early next year. Yep. 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 Just after the Italians. So a whole lot of people wanted to know, Chris, mm -hmm. will we see options for the M3 75mm GMC and the T19 105mm HMC? Mm -hmm. So they are half tracks with a 75mm and a tank gun mm -hmm. and a 105mm howitzer added to the range. The short answer is no, not at this time. Um, the way it works, and there's probably a little insight into the, into the process that goes in behind the scenes to books. Um, whenever the studio works on a project, um, it, we come up with a list, or Phil or whoever else comes up with a list of the products that they'd like to see as part of that book. From there we determine how many blisters, how many box sets, a token set, paint set, all that sort of stuff has to come together. As I said, Chris is actually working pretty hard behind the scenes, <laughs> that's his that, job. <laughs> that's part of my job, yeah. <laughs> so from there we generate a massive list, and basically we say, we think that with this book we would like to have 30 new products. Then we put that list out, the, uh, the uh, heads of the sales teams have a look at it, owners of the company have a look at it, um, they look at our release schedule. Production guys. Yep, and they look and they say, well, realistically this book is going to be scheduled for a two month release. So it's only going to have enough products released with it to cover two months. Um, or three. Or, or three four, or four. Or one. Yep. Uh, depends. Depends yep. on the product. And in this case, uh, it's a, a two month release window. That basically means we can only have a certain number of releases. So from there we have to uh, look through and decide how can we trim it down. Um, our first port of call is how can we be coming? How can we get two products into one blister or three products into one blister? Because we can't go out to retailers and that's how we sell our product. We go out to bricks and mortar stores, we sell product to them, they sell it to you. If we can't get a bricks and mortar store to stock it, you can't buy it and we won't make it. So we go out and we look at how many releases we've got, pair them down and then come up with a final list. From there, it's discussed, is that too many? Is that too few? Do we have the right mix? And sometimes there are products that just don't make it at the end of the day. Um, in this particular case, these were some of them. William was asking, um, a sort of a related question. What unit did you want to see included, but for one reason or another had to cut? Well, I'm going to actually jump in and answer my own question first and then yep. Chris uh, go on with it. But actually the M3 75mm GMC was one yep. that I really did want to include. Yep. But when it came down to it in the end, it was a product that just couldn't fit within our, um, our whole business model. Yep. Um, it would have been great to have it, but yeah, it just didn't work. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I, um, I like the idea of it too. I think, complete bias here, building my lead company, I don't have, coincidentally, the page is open, 32 points for four M10s. I think they're worth the 32 points, but I don't necessarily have them because I wanted to try and take a full formation of leads. Whereas I could have probably found the points to put a platoon of M3s in. Mm. Um, I mean, other than that, oh, it sounds terrible. I, ha I hadn't forgotten about the T19, the 105 yeah. HMC. Yeah. Um, 
but I, it's basically the same as a priest, just a little bit less blingy yeah. from a stat perspective, right? Yeah, it's not the same quite gun. as fast across country, same gun, same weaponry, mm. armor, not so great, but you know, it's usually sitting at the back doing its thing and yeah. does exactly the same job. Yeah. So we'd end up with two really, really closely competing models. Yep. Um, and we'd rather, given that we've only got so many slots, yep. putting in two 105 millimeter howitzers just didn't seem the best use of it because that would have had to take out something else. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we still make the T19. Yeah, it's still there available in the catalog. People who buy. love the T19 can just field them using the um, M7 stats. Yep. But I mean, other than those, I actually can't think of, there's nothing that jumps out to my mind that's missing or dropped I don't no think. not I mean there's a, obviously there's some of the you know, things we've talked about oh, things like ranges, I mean another one I mean people have asked about is the um, M5 version of the Stuart right but there was only um, one independent battalion of them in Tunisia mm -hmm. and they spent most of their time supporting the French, one company of them off supporting the French. Yeah. So they just don't really fit within the scope of the book. That's Again, enough. it's not a, not a key thing for the Americans at that stage. Yep. The M5 replaced the M3, yep. but not in this period. So again, if we actually get to do the Free French, we probably throw in an M5 yeah. to support them. I wouldn't have a problem with someone using M5 stewards and an yeah. M3 stat card. I mean, yeah. it's all about putting your models on the table and having some fun. So, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, so hopefully you've, you've learned something. Hopefully we haven't bored you to tears. Hopefully you know, haven't talked too much at you. Um, hope you've enjoyed it, obviously. Hope you've had a chance to pick up Fighting First, have a read through it. Um, and have a few games would be great too. It, it is really good. quite a fun book, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really quite happy from, <laughs> about it from that viewpoint. Yes, yeah, no, I think it's, it's great from that perspective too. So yeah, hope you've enjoyed the video and we'll see you next time. Farewell. Well.